The only way to handle danger is to face it. If you start getting frightened of it, then you make it worse. Because you project onto it all kinds of bogies and threats which don't exist in it at all. So this is also a rule. And please, anybody here who's a psychotherapist, if he doesn't know this already, take note. If you get someone thrown on your hands, who as a result of taking any psychotropic drug is in a psychotic state, don't be frightened. Because the moment you're afraid, your patient will pick up your fear by a kind of osmosis and get worse. Don't challenge them. Don't bug them. Don't frighten them. You mustn't frighten them because they are doing a very far out act. They're walking uh, on a tightrope, miles up. And they've got to do that balancing act. And if you shout, they may lose their nerve. See, that's what the, we call the responsible people of the world are doing. It is an act, it's a game, just like the tightrope walker. But it's a risky one. And you can get ulcers from it. And uh, all sorts of troubles. But you must respect it. And say, congratulations on being so far out. <coughs> so now, <clears throat> this is the whole essence, you see, of seeing, if you really see, into this secret that the world doesn't contain any serious threats in it because it's all the basic you running up behind itself and saying boo to see if you can get yourself to jump out of your skin <laughs> if you see that be cool the rule about all terrors going back to where I started from the dweller on the threshold the rule for all terrors is head straight into them. When you are sailing in a storm, you don't let a wave hit your boat on the side. You go bow into the wave and ride it. So in the same way, old folklore says, this is an old wives' tale with a lot of truth in it, whenever you meet a ghost, don't run away. Because the ghost will capture the substance of your fear and materialize itself out of your own substance and will kill you eventually because it will take over all your own vitality. So then, whenever confronted with a ghost, walk straight into it and it will disappear. And so in the same way, when people uh, stir up the depths of the unconscious and are confronted with their own monsters or with the terrors of discovering that they're in a relativistic world where black implies white and white implies black, so who's in charge? You know, grandfather's dead, father's dead too, this leaves me. Ooh, who's the authority? <laughs> See, when you get that, that sense of terror, go right at it. Don't run away. Uh, explore, feel fear as completely as you can feel it. Head straight into it. And just it so happens that these things give you the property uh, and the opportunity, let me put it that way, the opportunity to go into some of your very, very most closely kept skeletons. And the result of that is invariably beneficial. But you see, the trouble about deep secrets is they can't be repressed indefinitely. As a certain president of the United States once remarked, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And we, uh, human beings, have been systematically fooled by ourselves. It isn't as if there was some deep, dark conspiracy with somebody else to blame. For quite a number of centuries, into the notion that we are strangers in the universe. <clears throat> that the world that lies beyond the border of our skins is not ourselves, <clears throat> and is some quite alien mechanical contraption into which we arrived and from which we will disappear. And uh, we really have nothing very much to do with it. It's something about which we can take an objective point of view, we can look at it, we can uh, measure it, we can calculate it, but it all turns out in the end to be some sort of stupid, stupid mechanism 
in which we are involved because as bodies we are part of it. But it is common sense for most individuals that they themselves aren't even their bodies. They are alienated spooks which have bodies like people have cars <laughs> and uh, in which they go around and confront the external world as if it were something in which you were trapped and as this becomes clear to you it's rather shaking because it look if what you define as you is inseparable from everything which you define as not you, just as front is inseparable from back, then you realize that deep down between self and other, there is some sort of conspiracy. If these things always occur in combination and look very different from each other and feel quite different, nevertheless, the feeling of difference between them allows each one to exist. And so underneath the opposition or the polarity between self and other or between any other pair of opposites you can think of, there is something in common as there is, for example, between figure and background. You can't see a figure without a background. You can't have an organism without an environment. Equally, you can't have a background without a figure or an environment without organisms in it or without things in it. You can't have space which is unoccupied by any solid. You can ha cannot have solids not occupying some space. This is absolutely elementary and yet we don't realize it because, for example, the average person thinks that space is nothing. But it's just a sort of not thereness in which there are things. And we are slightly afraid that not thereness, that nothingness, that darkness, that the negative poles of all these oppositions will win. That they will eventually swallow up every kind of being and every kind of thereness. But when you catch on to the game, you realize that that won't happen because what is called not existing is quite incapable of uh, being there without the contrast of something called existing. It's like the crest and the trough of a wave. You can't have a wave that is all trough and no crest, just as you can't have a wave which is all crest and no trough. Such a thing has never been manifested in the physical universe. They go together. And that is the secret. There really is no other secret than that. But it is thoroughly repressed. And therefore, we are all educated to feel that we've got to fight for the white because the black might win. We've got to survive. You must survive. That's the great thing we're all working under and pounding it out day after day in anxiety because this is a description of anxiety. Anxiety is the fear that one of a pair of opposites might cancel the other forever. And if by any chance, by any means, you find out that that is not so, you have an entirely new attitude to what human beings are doing, which may be very creative, but which also may be very dangerous you see through the game. The game called White Must Win. Because you know that neither black nor white are going to win. Because they belong to each other. <clears throat> and that is what I will call the sensation as well as the intellectual understanding of polarity. That is to say that the inside and the outside, the subjective and the objective, the self and the other, go together. 
In other words, uh, what uh, there is a harmony, <laughs> an unbreakable harmony. I'm, when I'm using the word harmony, I don't necessarily mean something sweet. I mean absolute uh, concordant relationship between what goes on inside your skin and what goes on outside your skin. It isn't that what goes on outside is so powerful that it pushes around and controls what goes on inside. Equally so, it isn't that what goes on inside is so strong that it often succeeds in pushing around what goes on outside. It is very simply that the two uh, processes, the two behaviors, are one. What you do is what the universe does. And what the universe does is also what you do. Not you in the sense of your superficial ego, which is a very small, little tiny area of your conscious sensitivity, but you in the sense of your total psychophysical organism, conscious as well as unconscious.